It's wonderful to be with you this morning. <laughs> Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. <sighs> Welcome to all who are gathered here on site and online. I'm Pastor Gretchen Pierscala, and I'm glad you're here. This was my first week here at Zion, and I'm grateful that some of you have already stopped by and introduced yourselves and have made appointments to meet with me and to meet and introduce me to people in the community, so thank you. I am eager to begin our ministry together. Next week, uh, the church celebrates Pentecost, so we're all invited to wear red in celebration of the Spirit and the work that the Spirit does. Thank you for all the progress for that is being done on the construction project with the new bathroom and the new church office. Feel free to see the progress yourselves. It is wonderful. Thank you for all who are engaged in those works for us as a church. Now, as they say, it was a quiet week in Lake Wobegon. But there was a whole lot of whooping and hollering over at the Krieger household. Maybe you've heard. Their daughter, Montana, is one of the 10 finalists for the Princess K of the Milky Way Dairy Princess Contest. Now, she's not here this morning. (laughs) She's not here with us this morning because she's milking cows. Well, that means that as one of the 10 finalists, that she will be sitting in a cooler and getting her likeness carved out of butter. So be sure to go to the state fair and see her head carved out of butter. (laughs) Congratulations. Um, Jane Sharp has an announcement for us today. We're going to be having a little work day to clean things up, and I wore my work clothes, so I'm ready to get started. Thanks, Jane. I don't know about any of you, but when I was getting dressed like this to come to church, I saw my dad's dad look. (laughs) (laughs) So let's get a lot of work done today, so uh, I feel better. Bear with us, this is the first year we're doing this. Please let the stewardship committee, um, the, the trustees, anybody know with any other suggestions that you might have. After church, we will meet outside and be directed. Um, according to the Shiro's, the cemetery is pretty good. We need a couple people to go there to um, fill gopher holes. The gophers have been busy. So, and thank you to whoever's been filling them. Pam said that there is some that have already been filled. So I don't think the gophers are kicking the dirt back in. So thank you to whoever did that. Um, Potluck. um, I've heard from people that they need to go home and do a little cooking. So we're going to plan on eating at noon. Um, I know before we kind of said 1130. We have to be respectful of the Maranatha group. They're going to be meeting downstairs at 1. So we want to be cleaned up and out of there. So, um, those that are not able to help clean up, please stick around and downstairs for fellowship. Roseanne has the coffee on, and um, whatever we don't get done today, I'm sure we will set up time during the weeks ahead to get done, but it's going to be kind of good. I actually took a walk around church, which I haven't done for a long time, and I think it's good for all of us to see that. Oops. Got to figure out how this new microphone pack is going to work for me. So there we go. Thank you, Jane, and for all who will be um, 
helping out with the work day as well as staying for fellowship. This is some of the best work we do as church in gathering together in worship and fellowship. So today we begin with a thanksgiving for baptism. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, by whose hand we are given birth, new birth, and whose speaking, and by whose speaking we are given new life. Amen. Joined, in, joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are welcomed, restored, and supported as citizens of the new creation. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. Holy God, holy and merciful, holy and mighty, you are the river of life, you are the everlasting wellspring. In mercy and might, you have freed us from death and raised us with Jesus, the firstborn of the dead. In baptismal waters, our old life is washed away and in them we are born anew. Glory to you for oceans and lakes, for rivers and streams. Honor to you for waters that wash us clean. Quench our thirst and nurture both crops and creatures. Praise to you for the life-giving waters of baptism, the outpouring of the spirit of the new creation. Wash away our sin and all that separates us from you. Empower our witness to your resurrection. Strengthen our resolve in seeking justice for all. Satisfy the world's need through this living water. Where drought dries the earth, bring refreshment. Where despair prevails, grant hope and where chaos reigns, bring peace. We ask this through Christ, who with you and the Spirit reigns forever. Amen. Amen. We sing together number 392, Alleluia, Sing to Jesus.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you. Please turn to your worship folder while we continue with the prayer of the day. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God of glory, your Son, Jesus Christ, suffered for us and ascended to your right hand. Unite us with Christ and each other in suffering and in joy, that all the world may be drawn into your bountiful presence through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with our readings for the day. Our first reading today is from Acts chapter 1, beginning with the sixth verse. Today's reading is part of the introduction to the narrative of the outpouring of the Spirit of Pentecost. These verses tell of the risen Lord's conversation with his disciples on the eve of his ascension, in which he promises that they will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. When the apostles had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing up toward heaven. Suddenly, two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including the mother of uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. Word of God, word of life. Be to God. Our psalm today is Psalm 68, beginning with the first verse. We'll read it responsively. Let God arise and let God's enemies be scattered. Let those who hate God flee. 
Yes. But let the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. Let them also be merry and joyful. In your holy habitation, O God, you are a father to orphans, defender of widows. O oh God, when you went forth before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, you sent a bountiful rain, O oh God. You restored your inheritance when it languished. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing praises to the Lord. You ride in the heavens, O God, in the ancient heavens. You send forth your voice, your mighty voice. Ascribe power to God, whose majesty is over Israel, whose strength is in the skies. Our second reading today is from 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning with the 12th verse. Our faith in Christ does not make us immune from the scorn of others. Nevertheless, we are to resist the designs of evil when we experience disparagement from others because we trust God's grace will strengthen and guide us. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast away your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves, keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary the devil prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Word of God, word of life. Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, o Lord. On the night before his crucifixion, Jesus prayed to his heavenly Father, asking that those who continue his work in this world will live in unity. After Jesus had spoken these words to his disciples, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, 
Glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me. They have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I come from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, Protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. I want to invite the children to come up for this time for the, child, for the Sermon on the Steps. Pastor Gretchen, can you put your mic on, please? Pastor Gretchen, can you put your mic on, please? There. How's that? Good. Well, I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you in the days and weeks and years ahead. So welcome and thank you for joining me on the steps this morning. In our gospel reading today, Jesus prayed for his disciples. Could you tell that that was a prayer that we were reading today? Yeah. And he prayed that his disciples would be how many? One. How is that possible for you and you and you and me and you and you and you and you and you and you and all of you and all the people who are online watching us? How is that possible for us to be one? Do you have any ideas? What does it mean to be one? That's a hard one, isn't it? Does it mean to be the same as everybody else? No. Yeah. To be yourself? Yes. You can be one in yourself. Yes. And how can be one with others? Share some what? Say, share the same energy? Well, say purpose, yeah, or goals, like being on the same team. Yeah, you've got many players on the same team, right? Yeah, work together. Work together? Yeah, and we're going to work together today. How about in your families? Are you one in your family? Yeah. You share the same name, in the same house, maybe? Yeah. Well, that quilt over there, I think, is a good picture of what it means to be one. Because you said it's about being yourself, right? Not being the same with everybody else. That 
All together, yes. That quilt was, each square is different, isn't it? And they were all cut out by, I think it was either our seniors or people in confirmation. Anyway, different people cut out all those squares. And yeah, and that one too. And then someone sewed them all together, right? And in Jesus, I wonder if Jesus' prayer is like being sewn all together. What do you think about that? Maybe? Yeah. Do you ever pray at home? Yeah? Like before bed? I, when I was growing up, I would pray, now I lay me down to sleep. Do you know that one? Yeah. Yeah. And then afterwards, um, I would pray for, and God bless all the people in my family and the people that I cared about, right? Prayed for grandparents and parents and siblings. Sometimes I didn't like playing, praying for my siblings, my brother and my sister, but I prayed for them anyway. <laughs> yeah. I prayed for the animals that we care about and love. Yeah, and the things going on in the world. Have you ever heard someone pray for you? Uh huh. What was that like? It was good? Yeah? Is it comforting when someone pray, when you hear the words of someone praying for you? Yeah. What is it? Yeah, yeah. Is it kind of like that blanket kind of coming over you and just comforting you? Just that subtle little pressure of being under the blanket? Yeah. I think Jesus' prayer covers us like that. So when you crawl into bed at night, can you remember that Jesus' prayer covers you? Okay. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for the gift of prayer that makes us one. Help us to pray for others and remember that we are one with them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming up today. You can go head back to your seats. I want to be able to use my hands, so I'm going to stand over here today. Do you need this microphone on too? Are we good? We're good. All right. Grace and peace to you from God who hears all prayers and from our Lord Jesus who prays for you. Dear friends in Christ, it is so good to be here with you all. I am glad that you are here and that we get to begin ministry together. Thank you to the many individuals who came to be united in prayer who brought us all to this day, giving glory to God. Many prayers went into this day. And the first prayer, I think, that led us to this day was Jesus' prayer for his disciples from John 16 that we just heard a little bit ago. The sermon title for today is Unified for Kingdom Work. And so that raises two questions in my mind. How are we unified in Jesus' prayer? And what is the kingdom work that we are unified to do? The gospel reading today takes us back to Holy Week, to the day when Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey, when that parade formed and people waved palm branches and the crowd shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna to the King of David, Hosanna in the highest. And we remember that Hosanna means save us because they hoped that Jesus would overturn the Roman Empire and restore the kingdom of David in Israel. Now later that day, when Jesus was alone with his disciples, Jesus washed his disciples' feet and gave them a new commandment to love one another, 
and serve one another and other people as neighbors and friends and strangers in the same way that Jesus served and loved them. And then Jesus spoke to the disciples for the next four chapters about all the things that he wanted them to know before he died. And after this long goodbye, we come to this prayer that Jesus prays for the disciples and they get to hear the words that we heard from John 17. And I wonder what it was like for them to hear Jesus in his familiar voice to pray for them in this way. Can you imagine Jesus praying those words for you? I know that when I he hear someone praying for me, I fear their love and I feel comforted, like in, in the warmth of a blanket, and I feel supported and enlivened so that I can walk in newness of life, just like God promises, right? And I can only imagine what it could have been like for those disciples. What is it like when someone prays for you? Some of you have shared with me that when, someone, when you hear that someone is praying for you, you can kind of feel that support holding you up during that difficult time. And you know when you hear the actual words of their prayer, it stays with you and strengthens you in your daily life. I am struck by the intimacy in Jesus' prayer and the ease with which he prays this prayer to God. And this ease strikes me as a little bit odd because it is the final prayer that Jesus prays before his crucifixion. He knows it's coming, but there's no sign of anguish, and there's no bargaining or desire for his life to go another way. Jesus knows his death is coming, and he tells this to the disciples. I imagine the disciples upon hearing this are filled with sadness and possibly experience the stages of grief, denial and anger, depression and bargaining, wrestling with them like a rugby pile of emotions long before the acceptance or meaning making come alongside them. I can imagine them trying to imagine what it would be like to live their life without Jesus, much like when we have here the loved one, one of our loved ones has a diagnosis of something, we wonder how will we live without them. But the grief of the disciples is much like our own, isn't it? And their grief does not stop. It is a storm, but the clouds will part on the resurrection morning. Jesus also knew that someone would betray him, and all of them would abandon him. And he told them this. And they all wanted to deny it. No, not I. I could never do that, Lord. Not to you. Not ever. Even so, Jesus knew that they would, and he washed their feet, and he prayed for them this lovely prayer. Now, I don't know if I could have been so gracious knowing that someone would betray me or disappoint me in some way. So maybe our not knowing the future is a gift of grace and a gift from God so that we might be able to be kind and so generous with one another, as Jesus did on that night in which he was betrayed with his disciples. 
because Jesus wants his disciples and us to know and share in this deep intimacy with God, the Father who loves and protects all his children. Jesus prays that they and we would all be one, the Father and Jesus and all the disciples, all one. And Jesus' prayer extends beyond these verses, beyond the 12 disciples who were with him on that night. For in verse 20, Jesus prays on behalf of all who will come to believe in Jesus through the word that flows from these first disciples, through their witness, to generation after generation, like ripples of water in the baptismal font of life. So Jesus not only prayed for these first disciples, but he prayed for you and me as well. Jesus prayed that we would all be one. And I think Jesus has a pretty good idea of how difficult it is for humans to be one. Some have even said it is impossible. And yet, Jesus called all kinds of people to follow him. And he calls them friends. Even when they argue with one another about who is the greatest and tries to determine this, disciples don't always agree on everything and friends don't always get along. So maybe Jesus had something more in mind than just getting along with each other and agreeing all the time. So what does it look like that we are one with God as we live among other people? And what makes this oneness possible? Earlier this week, my fitness instructor was talking about the 360 bones in the human body and she had a number for all the joints and the muscles and tendons, numbers that I don't remember. But all these parts, and our organs too, she said, are surrounded by connective tissue. Connective tissue. And I wondered, maybe Jesus' prayer for the disciples is something like that connective tissue in our own bodies that connects us to all of the parts of our body. Is that how we are made one? Could it be that we are unified in Jesus' prayer? Now in the first reading from Acts, we are told all the names of the disciples and others who are gathered after the resurrection, and they dedicate themselves to prayer. Dedicated. Now that is a word, isn't it? Like an athlete or a musician, they are dedicated to practice. Dedication is a powerful thing. And maybe when Jesus prayed, they experienced something powerful and they wanted to dedicate themselves to praying for others like Jesus prayed for them. In this prayer, Jesus models for us a form of prayer, one that is intimate with God as a father. And Jesus reviews his action and his ministry. Do you ever do that at the end of a day? Review the day and think about all the things that you did and the things you didn't do and give them to God to work it out and add grace anyway? Jesus' purpose and desire is to glorify God and for God to be glorified in him. And he prays that the oneness that already exists between he and God, that we might share in that oneness. That oneness that Jesus knew from the beginning of time when he and God and the Holy Spirit created everything with God's word. And so maybe the power of God's word, the power of Jesus' word in this prayer, makes us one. It is not something that we have to do for ourselves. Now throughout John's Gospel, we hear many of the I am statements of Jesus. 
I am the vine, I am the way, I am the truth and the gate and the living water, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life. And all of these names, these I am statements, are also names for God, who is one with Jesus. And each name reveals something about Jesus, something about who God is, who God is for us, and who we are for one another. For when we are baptized in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, we become children of God. We are named and claimed and bear God's name just like we are born into families and bear the same names. But it is hard for us to get along as a family too, isn't it? Maybe you have heard about the importance of connection and the epidemic of loneliness. I've been hearing this a lot lately. Vivek um, Murthy, the U.S. Surgeon General, had an article and an interview about it. And I heard another thing this morning on the way here, that bonding with one another is so important for us. It's part of our human condition. And yet, we cannot bond well with one another. And so this is the root of our addictions. We seek alcohol or drugs or eating or being busy or buying things because we cannot bond well with one another. But these addictions, these things that we bond to, never do what we ask them to. Our only bond that will hold us, that will fill us, is the bond that God has for us that meets us in our deep human need that we can access through prayer. Jesus knows how hard it is for the disciples, both then and now, to be united with one another, to be united in God. Whether as friends or in the same family, it is difficult for us to be one. My colleague, Pastor Nadia Boltzweber, whenever she welcomes new members into her church or whenever she joins a new congregation, she makes them this promise. She says, I promise that I will at some point in our ministry together disappoint you. It's not my intention, but it will happen. And you will disappoint me. I'm sure it's not your intention either. And then she asks, would you be willing to make a commitment to our relationship that when you are disappointed in me or unclear, that you would come and talk to me instead of talking about me to others? That's a big ask, right? But she makes that commitment. She says, I will make that commitment to you to come to you when I am disappointed or unclear about something that you've said so that the kingdom of God might be at work in and among and within us. Brene Brown studied disappointment and she discovered that disappointment is linked to expectations. She found that disappointment occurs when expectations are unclear or unspoken or unreasonable. And she discovered that that means that we are responsible for our own disappointment. Yikes, right? That's both good news and bad news. And so I can also make this promise that Pastor Nadia makes to you. I will disappoint you, even though it's not my intention. And you will disappoint me. And I know that's not your intention either. We will disappoint each other. And I can make that same promise to you and commitment. 
I invite us to embrace our disappointment and maybe even get a little excited because I think when disappointment clouds us and visits us, it is an opportunity that can move us closer to our hearts and closer to one another. It is an opportunity to practice repentance and reconciliation as Jesus taught to practice giving and receiving forgiveness, to get clear with one another about what we want and need. This is the kingdom work that Jesus taught and makes possible in us and for us. This is the kingdom work that practicing forgiveness is resurrection power, and it is possible because of Jesus' resurrection, not our own muster. I think it's fitting that we're having a work day today, that we begin to steward that which has been given to us. This property that we have received, we get to feed one another with our gifts, and we get to steward the gifts and our abilities for the benefit of many others. Jesus glorified God by finishing the work that God gave him to do. And we glorify God by doing the work that God has called us to do, to practice giving and receiving forgiveness, to love the world God has created, and to bless others. May our work be our prayer, and our prayer be our work for the glory of God in Christ Jesus. Amen.
whole church, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please share a sign of this peace with one another. God's peace to you. God's peace to you. Thanks. God's peace. God's peace to you. God's peace to you. God's peace. God's peace. God's peace to you. God's peace to you, Michael. God's peace. God's peace to you. God's peace. God's peace to you. God's peace to you. God's peace to you. God's peace to you. Peace. God's peace to you. God's peace. God's peace to you. God's peace to you. God's peace to you. God's peace. God's peace. God's peace. God's peace to you. We continue with our offering. Let us pray. Generous God, 
In this meal you offer your very self. We give thanks for these gifts of earth. In the breaking of this bread, reveal to us the risen one. In the pouring of this wine, pour us out in service to the world. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Rejoicing in the victory of God's resurrection, we lift our prayers to God. Good and gracious God, you draw all people to yourself through your Son, Jesus Christ. Make us one with you and one another. Strengthen and protect your church in mutual love for the sake of the world. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. As your spirit hovered over the waters of creation, so your spirit hovers all that you have made. Bless the waters that sustain our planet and grant wisdom to use it wisely. Grant favorable weather for farmers so that all may be fed. Empower all who are baptized to be witnesses of your resurrection. Hear us, O God. Resurrected Lord, you care for all your children. Show your steadfast love to those suffering in body, mind, spirit, or relationship. We pray especially for exiles, refugees, and prisoners. Break the chains of all who have been held fast by addictions, violent relationships, or systemic oppression of any kind. Comfort all who grieve, and grant courage and strength with patience for all those in need of healing. We pray especially for Christy, Lowell, Jenna, Glenn, Dilshad and Sonia, for Cindy and Ginny, Douglas and Gary, for Mark and B. Surround Ginny and Bert, Lyle, Laverne and Gary in your love. Hear us, O God. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God, trusting in your mercy and power, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Receive this blessing. The God of all who raised Jesus from the dead bless you by the power of the Holy Spirit to live in the new creation. Amen. Amen. We sing our sending song, number 855, Crown Him with Many Crowns.
Go in peace, serve the risen one. Thanks be to God.